right into it? Let's do that. Tonight, I got a question for you. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? How many of you like to eat? I like to eat. And about every four months, I got to stop eating so I can prepare myself to liking to eat again. I don't know about you, but I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to bring you into my marriage for a moment. If you've ever been out to dinner with Jan and I, Jan never finishes her meal. Never. She will always take food home. In other words, she's always going to have something additional to eat because she is preparing for more to eat later. And she always wants to split it with me, and I never want to split a meal. Guys, how many of you never want to split a meal? I order what I want, and I eat what I want. And let me make it clear, if you're going to bring it home and put it in the fridge, there is a certain amount of time before it's mine. Are you with me? Yeah, because that's just the rules of the game because I like to eat. Exodus 16. I want to talk about what's going on while the Israelites are complaining in the desert because they don't have things to eat. They're hungry and they don't have things to eat. Exodus 16, 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the congregation of the sons of Israel, come near before the Lord for he's heard your grumblings. I told you about a week ago about what it's like to grumble in front of my dad and know that oop, it's time for the belt to come out. God's just done it again. It came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation, the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. So speak to them saying, at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about at the evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a, f- a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? Everybody say, what is it? You know why they said, what is it? For they did not know what it was. That's why they said, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. I want you to listen to a few phrases here because we're about to tear them apart and dig into them. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. Say that, as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons uh, that each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I've heard the manna story in the wilderness preached, it is always about the daily provision of God. God gives us daily, daily we gather, daily we have the bread. We're not going there tonight because there's this interesting phrase, as much as he should eat. The phrase, as much as he should eat, what does that actually mean? Because in the Greek, as much as he should eat is only two words. I'm sorry, Greek, Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it's only two words. The two words are perer, which means the mouth, and akel, akel, which means to devour or to eat. Devour, eat with the mouth. The difference is when you put them together, the literal translation of the two words means according to his eating or as much as he would eat. 
Let me, let me show you something about scripture and translations because I, I had someone email me this week and I responded about this. When it comes to translations of the Bible, there are really three different broad categories of translation. The first one is called interlinear. Interlinear. What does that mean? It means word for word. Here's the word in Hebrew. Here's what it translates to in English. Here's the word in Greek. Here's what it translates to in English. With no care or concern about about sentence structure, word for word translations. You'll see that in the King James. You'll see it in the NASB. You'll see it in the CVS. If not the gross, not the drugstore, but the Bible. C E S. Okay. Then the second is called a phrase by phrase or thought by thought. In other words, someone is reading the Hebrew or the Greek and saying, what does that phrase mean? And how do I translate that phrase? That's actually kind of critical for us because what we find out is when we begin to read things, if they're put in the phrasing that we're used to, it's easier to read. I'll give you an example. If you look in the Spanish, they might say Casablanca. But in the English, we don't say casa meaning house and blanca meaning white. We say white house. So somebody has read the phrase and put it in the way we read it. Okay? That you'll find in things like the NIV and the NAB. Then there's paraphrase. Paraphrase is not translation. Paraphrase is interpretation. It is somebody reading a sentence and saying, this is what I think they mean when they have written this. That's the NLT and the Message Bibles. Okay? So we're going to look at two more interlinear transitions. Now, the question that was asked to me was, what's the right translation to use? Yes. <laughs> Turn your Bible over, look on the back, that's the right one for you. <laughs> no, see, it matters what you're using it for. I don't teach out of paraphrases or phrase for phrase. I teach out of interlinear. I want to be as close to the original wording as I can, so hopefully I grasp truly what that original meaning was. But when you get up in the morning and you want to have a cup of coffee and sit on your back porch and you want to read your Bible, and NIV is probably a whole lot easier to read because the sentence structure flows a little bit better. If you've got someone who's brand new to Christ, doesn't know anything at all, maybe a paraphrase would be a good thing for them to concept understand Christianity. But in the interlinear translations, the other two, I use the NASB 95, if you want to know. Exodus 16, 18. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered a little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. In the King James, when they did meet with, when they did met with it with omer, he gathered much, uh, he that gathered much, I'm not used to reading King James. He that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. So what he's saying is, he's asking them to gather according to what they will eat according to what they will eat. And I want to go a little bit further because the word omer is in there. They're gathering an omer. Well, then aren't they all gathering a same amount of food? Uh, omer in the Hebrew is a unique word because it's used in several different ways. It's the same word, means the same thing, but used in different ways. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. First of all, it's a specific measurement. It is one-tenth of an ephah. It's about two liters. It's also used as a measured amount. In other words, the amount that they got. Easy way for that to transfer into what we're talking about is to say, if you went and got a cup of water, a cup is eight ounces. We know what a measured cup is. But if I told you to go to the sink and get a cup of water, you would not think I need to get exactly eight ounces of water. You would get approximately a cup of water. And when we look at this scripture and he told them to go out with an Omar, the usage is that second one. Take your Omar and go get some for yourself. Go get an Omar worth. Go get a cup worth. Well, some people got an overflowing cup and some people got an undercut cup, but everybody is getting a cup. It's like saying, I got a cup of bread. 
not necessarily eight ounces of bread, but I got me a cup full, an omer full. So verse 18 says, when they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered uh, had much, who had gathered much had no excess, and who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. So they took cups out there, omers, and they gathered bread, and some got a lot, and some got a few, but everyone got what they would eat. The confirmation that that's the direction he's going in the text is actually in the next verses. The next verses say this. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it till morning. But they did not listen to Moses and some left part of it until morning and it bred worms and became foul and Moses was angry with them. They gathered it in a morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. How, why am I saying that's a confirmation? Because if they were all getting a specific measure of Omer, then God was deciding this is how much a man will eat. You will eat an Omer. But he says some of them had some left over, some of them didn't have enough, some of it rotted in the morning. So they were supposed to gather an omer, but how much they would eat. In other words, how much you gather should be how much satisfies your hunger. Oh, we're going to go there. How much satisfies your hunger? How much will you eat? How much do you desire to eat? So the question is, how is your appetite? How is your appetite? Because he's going to want you to get an equal portion to what your appetite is. And there has to be an appetite in order food to satisfy it. Are you hearing me? I got to be hungry and I got to be hungry to a certain portion so that a certain portion of food satisfies my hunger. You don't give me enough. My hunger is not satisfied. You give me too much. My hunger can be satisfied, but then I can have things left over. It'll make sense in a minute. I promise. If you have a want, it can be provided until you are satisfied. And that is according to your desire for it. How much you desire is how much he is providing for you. Oh, stay with me. How much you desire, he's trying to satisfy your desire. So if your desire is big, he's going to satisfy it with a lot. If your desire is small, he doesn't have to provide as much. I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, Texas de Brazil or to a Fogo de Chao. Anybody know those names? That's the place where they got meat on a stick. Okay, so you're sitting at a table and they bring these big swords, if you will, that have pork and chicken and steak and they come to your table and you've got a little disc on your table and you say, my hunger is not satisfied, therefore they will come and slice you off a little more meat. And you know what they'll do? They'll walk away and they'll wait. And they'll wait to see if you say, no, that satisfies my hunger, or no, I want more, and they will bring you more. Why? Because your hunger has not been satisfied. So they will continue to bring it until your hunger is satisfied. Some of you are catching up. It's like that with faith. God can supply faith, but where is your desire for faith? God dispenses levels of faith, and he gives you a certain amount of faith. Romans 12, 3. For those the grace, uh, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than you ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Faith. Let me show you how that plays out, that measure of faith plays out in the Christian walk. Have you ever talked to somebody that's constantly having dreams and visions? And they're telling you, God has given me these things and it's answering my question and things are going on and I'm, you know, I'm getting satisfied with that. And have you ever stopped and said, I'm kind of jealous of that? that you always get these dreams, that you always get these visions. Uh, You know, I I, kind of wish that would happen to me, but it doesn't happen to me, and so I don't know why. That always confused me until about, out of six, seven years ago, uh, I met the McNutts out of um, um, 
Is that right? McNutt, John, and Carol are not. The are nots out of Toronto. Uh, and, and, and here was my thing. The McNutts, the are nots, you know. The following week, I met the R's and then I met the are nots, okay? But here's the thing that always got to me. I was new to being in the Spirit. I was new to being baptized in the Spirit. I was new to walking in the Spirit. And I was watching people pray over people. And people would have these dramatic moments and fall out in the Spirit. And then they'd come to me and pray. And I'd stand there like a brick. Like nothing. Uh, thank you for your prayer. I appreciate that. It's, it's yeah, nothing. And so one night we're all standing in a line and John and Carol are coming down the line and they're praying for everybody. And John just pours out this passionate prayer over me. And I'm like, I'm not going to fake this. I'm just going to stand there and see what happens. Nothing happens. And so he moves on and man, as soon as he moved off, Carol steps right in front of me and she looks at me. She says, you wonder why you don't fall down, don't you? And I was like, well, yeah. And she said, you don't need to. And I said, explain that. And she said, there are certain experiences that people have that they need in order to move forward in faith. They receive that as a, now I know what God is doing. Now I've had an experience. She said, you will move in faith whether you have an experience or not. So don't worry about the experience. It's a measure of faith and you have a larger measure of faith. So you don't need that. So God pours these things out. But the question is, how big is your appetite for more faith? How big is your appetite for more of God? Because God is dispensing to you based on your level of hunger. And maybe you would say, well, lately I haven't been as hungry as I have been in the past. It's a little bit of a dry season. I don't know why. Let me ask the question, what has killed your hunger? What has killed your hunger? Maybe there's a pain in your life that is currently killing your hunger. Have you ever gotten stressed and decided, oh, I forgot to eat today? I got too busy and I forgot to eat today. That rarely happens to me, but it does. <laughs> and then sometimes there can be a pain in my past that makes me want to shy away from what God is providing. When I was 20 years old, 22, I'm sorry, 22 years old, one night I made shrimp and filet mignon on a barbecue grill. Hey, at the time, I was trying to put some extra money in my pocket. I had a full-time job, but I took a job throwing the Dallas Morning News in the Dallas area, okay? And that meant you had to get up at 3.30 a.m. You had to go down and pick up the papers. You had to roll them, put them in the bag, drive down the street, throw them car to car to car. Let me tell you what happens when you eat bad shrimp. <laughs> you get up at 4.30 in the morning, there's all kind of things going on that shouldn't be going on. And there are things flying in both directions that you're not exactly sure what to do with. And you suffer through that morning throwing the paper and making a whole lot of stops for other reasons. And you're sick like a dog the rest of the day, but you get over it. But you know what happens after that? For two years, I couldn't eat shrimp. For two years, I was like, get it away from me. I don't want to smell it. I don't want to taste it. I don't want... You ever been hurt in church? You ever been hurt by a prayer not getting answered? You've been hurt by not getting healed? And all of a sudden, you don't have a taste. You don't have a hunger anymore. You don't want any of this because I've just got this pain going on, and I'm having to back off for a little bit. Or maybe we're asking for more with our mouth, but our heart's not in it because of a pain in the past. So God will continue to dispense to you at the level of your hunger. You desire more, he'll give you more. You want to back off, he'll back off. But I don't know if you noticed in verse 19 and 20, it said, if they did not consume all they took, it rotted. God is giving us a picture that I'm going to supply you with as much of the bread of life as you want, but if you're going to waste it, it's going to go to waste. In other words, maybe I should be giving it to someone else who's hungrier than you. 
Maybe if you're asking for more than you're really ready for, you need to recalibrate a little bit because we don't want that wasted. He wants people who desire much, eat much, so he can give much supply. God is saying, I don't want to give it to you if it's going to go to waste. (laughs) It's kind of like my wife's leftovers in the fridge. (laughs) Because I'm looking at them and saying, that ain't going to waste. (laughs) Because I'm hungry and I want more, so I'm going to eat it. And the next day when she says, where are my leftovers? I just smile. Are you desiring what God wants to deliver to you? In verse 15, we kind of jokingly talked about it. They said, what is it? For they did not know what it is. What if God is supplying your need and you don't even recognize what he's supplying to you? What if he knows you need it and you don't know you need it, but he is supplying it and you're saying, I'm not hungry for it. Are you recognizing what God is supplying that you need? Maybe it's correction. And God is supplying correction like he did with the woman caught in adultery and say, go and sin no more. Uh, Maybe it's rebuking. Uh, Maybe like when Paul talked to Peter about his attitude with the Gentiles. Maybe it's training. Paul said, I trained with Jesus for three years. Isn't it interesting that so did the other disciples because that was the right amount to dispense and they took it. Maybe uh, he's supplying you with leaders and mentors like Elisha had Elijah. There was a time when he went by and he said, you're at the plow, I throw my cloak over you, all the way to the point where he went to the Jordan River and he gets takes up with the fire and he drops down his, his mantle and asks for a double portion. Do you know that time period was four years? Four years he supplied him with a mentor. Did it work? Was it the right amount? Was it the right amount that Elijah was hungry for? Guess what? Elijah did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. He was supplying him with the double portion that he was hungry for. Uh, Maybe it's challenges that build your faith. Abraham is known as the father of faith because he had one of the greatest challenges of faith we could ever face, which was the sacrifice of a child. Maybe God knows better what you need than you do. Maybe you don't even recognize what it is when he's giving it to you. Maybe God knows you need bread and he will supply as much bread as you want and he can supply more than you want, but he's going to dispense it based on your desire for that bread. God's supply is unlimited Therefore, he can give you however much you desire and you're hungry for. Do you remember Elijah telling the widow, you just keep bringing me pots and we'll continue to pour the oil until when? Until her capacity ceased. We kept pouring until you have no more capacity, widow. And when you have no more capacity, the supply stops. If she had had more capacity, then she would have gotten more oil. One more point before I go on. Why did God set this up to give them bread and then give them all this daily instruction about you have to gather it once a day. You have to gather so much of an omer for each family. Uh, You have to gather what you want and what you're going to need and don't gather too much. Why did he set all that up? I think it's because God wanted to know if they would go and gather the bread that he had given them. God wanted to know if he could trust them to do that on a daily basis. God wanted to know if they would eat until they were satisfied. God wanted to know that they would not take more than they could eat. And God wanted to know what their desire for bread was and how they handled it once they were given the full amount that satisfied them. You kind of got to know where I'm going, right? John 6 Not that anyone has seen the Father, Jesus said, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. 
I am, and you're thinking, that's a neat little preacher's trick that you talked all about manna in the wilderness and the bread and how much could you take and are you taking all that would satisfy you and what's your hunger level? And Jesus ends up saying, I'm the bread. Look at verse 49. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. And this is the bread which comes out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is the manna in the wilderness. Now I have to go back and say, what were the regulations that God laid out about the manna? He said, go get what you will consume. And however much you will consume, get that much. You don't need more than you will consume, but whatever level you are hungry at, I want you to be satisfied at that desire level. Jesus is the bread of life, compares himself to it, so God is asking you, how hungry are you for Jesus? How hungry are you for Jesus? What is your desire for the bread of life? And what becomes your satisfaction point? So here's the question. What is your appetite for Jesus? Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after a righteousness because they will be satisfied just like the manna. It's time for us to explore what does that mean for me today, the manna in the wilderness story, if Jesus is the bread of life. Do you trust God to give you your desires for Jesus every day? When you get up, do you look to gather from Jesus today what I need today, and is my desire today greater than my desire was yesterday? Are you going to waste what God is providing in the way of Jesus. Do you realize that he will give you as much Jesus as you desire? So how much mercy do you want today? How much faith do you want today? How hungry are you today for miraculous power? How much love do you want today? How much favor do you want today? How much abundance do you want today? How much grace and truth do you want today? How much destiny do you want revealed today? How much prophecy do you want in your life today? How much healing do you want today? How much transformation of the mind do you want today? In the book of John, Jesus says this about himself. I'm the bread of life. How much Jesus do you want? I'm the light of the world. How much light do you want in your life? Before Abraham was, I was. How much legacy do you want in your life? I'm the door. How many doors do you want open for you today? I'm the good shepherd. How much shepherding are you ready to receive today? I am the resurrection and the life. How much resurrection do you want to see in your life? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. How much of the way, the truth, and the life do you want, and do you want to be connected to the true vine? Are you ready to gather this bread of life? Are you ready to to desire more each day because I think it's time we up our consumption level. I would like to know that we are a church that puts a high demand on God for Jesus. I would like to know that he says, I just got to keep giving them more. Every time I give it to them, they come back the next day and they gather and want more and they want more and they want more and they want more and they want more. Here's the beauty. The satisfaction only lasts a day. And then I'm hungry again. Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to ask altar ministers to come forward. Because today, some of you want healing 
and it's available in the bread of life. And some of you want forgiveness, and it's available in the bread of life. And some of you want mercy for what's going on in your life, and it's available in the bread of life. And some of you want giftings, and it's available in Christ. Listen to me. What am I saying? Do you have any hunger tonight for more? Do you have any hunger to be set free from the things that have got you in bondage? Do you have any desire to see more of what Christ can do in your life? Do you want more healing? Do you want more freedom? What is it you want? There's going to be an expression of hunger that comes. And I know you're looking at the front and thinking, what are they doing with those ropes? I'm really intuitive that way. I'm sensitive to the audience. Here's what we're doing. We're trying to set apart a place for ministry where we can minister legitimately with impartation, with healing, uh, with an opportunity for people to meet God without so much encumbrance. And so we're dividing up some space and we're going to help people. So what I'm asking you, if tonight you want prayer, if tonight you want to seek more of something in Christ, if you want someone to ask, can you ask with me for God to provide more grace on my life, more mercy on my life? I am hungry to see more faith in my life. I want my faith level to be increased. We're going to ask you to just kind of come to the center and someone will help you get to an altar minister. So Father God, this morning, tonight, as we are here, I'm used to preaching on a Sunday. Jesus, I'm just going to say it straight up. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for more. Tomorrow, I want to be hungry for more than I was today. God, you provide, you provide, you provide, you provide. May we be a place that pulls on heaven to say, give us more. We're hungry for more. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.